Hi, everybody. So this is a little follow on to the uh, video showing the parts of the inside of the computer. I want to tell you a little bit about how these parts are connected and um, how information moves around within the computer and to and from the computer. So a little bit of review what we looked at inside the computer. So we have our the motherboard. Again, that's the main um, part of the computer that connects everything together. So inside the motherboard, right in the middle, we have our processor. That's our CPU, our central processing unit. The CPU, again, does all of the real grunt work that the computer completes. Um, so your CPU can actually store a little bit of information. Um, it stores the information in a uh, part of the CPU called the level one cache. There's a level one cache and a level two cache. So level one, level two cache. So the level one cache stores the information that you are currently working on. It's you know, going back to the working on your desk with a piece of paper and a pencil example. The level one cache is the letters that are directly underneath your pencil at this very moment. So there's very little information stored there, but any information that is there is accessible to the CPU very, very quickly. And when I say very quickly, this is the fastest thing your computer can do is access the information in the level one cache. Level two cache is kind of like the rest of the word that you're working on at the time. So your pencil tip is the level one cache. The word you're writing is the level two cache. Uh, some processors also have a level three cache um, that, I don't know, maybe that's with this, going with this analogy, maybe that's the rest of the sentence. Uh, I don't know. But um, these are the two, play, two pieces on your CPU that store information. They store very little information and it doesn't stay there long. It just stays there long enough to actually process it. So if you remember when we we're going through the inside of the computer, right next to the CPU was the random access memory or the RAM or the memory. So the random access memory, it's actually important that it's physically located close to the CPU. So uh, again, the fastest information your CPU can access is what's in the level one cache, followed by the level two cache, uh, but you can't hold much there. So your RAM can hold a lot more information. Uh, in the case of the computer I showed you in the video, it can hold uh, four gigabytes of RAM. The computer I use for uh, all my work at home here can hold 16 gigabytes of RAM. Um, but it's important that it's physically close to the CPU because the CPU needs to be able to access the information from the RAM. And it needs to be able to do so quickly. And it has to do it so quickly that it actually matters the physical distance, how close it is. So this information is moving at the speed of light. The closer the RAM is, the faster the CPU can get to it. And it's working at such speeds that it actually does make a difference. So that's the next fastest connection. So the fastest is CPU reading information in level one, level two cache. Next fastest is uh, the CPU reading information from the random access memory. What that means is any information you wanna be using in a computer program, you want to have it in your random access memory. You don't really get a choice on what's in the level one and level two cache. That sort of happens automatically. It's part of the architecture of the processor, what's in there and how much at any given time. But oftentimes in your program, you actually can control what's in the RAM. And any information that you want to be able to access quickly, you wanna have it in the RAM. So the next level is gonna be your hard drive. So your hard drive is not directly bolted to your motherboard. HDD, that stands for hard disk drive. Your hard drive is connected to the motherboard via a wire. Most hard drives these days are connected through a connection that's called serial ATA or SATA. And this can run at three gigabytes per second Sometimes it can run at six gigabytes per second. 
depends on the hard drive and the motherboard, how that connection can work. This is a very fast connection, don't get me wrong, but it's nowhere near as fast as this connection between the CPU and the RAM. So if you need to access information from the hard drive, that's gonna be a lot slower than accessing information from the RAM. So what you would generally wanna do is set up a program so that you are pulling information from the hard drive and storing it in RAM before you actually start working on it, rather than frequently accessing the hard drive. You wanna minimize the number of times you access the hard drive. And the reason for that is because it's much slower. So six gigabytes per second sounds fast, and it is, but it's much, much slower than the light speed transfer of information between your RAM and your CPU. That's only really limited by the speed of the CPU itself. The CPU, by the way, is often measured in uh, cycles per second or hertz. So the speed of a CPU is measured in hertz. Uh, when I first started using computers, we were usually talking about megahertz processors. So something with 266 megahertz was considered pretty fast when I got my first computer. Now that would be a total dog. Uh, now we're generally measuring things in gigahertz. Uh, the computer I took apart in the video has a speed of, I believe, 1.9 gigahertz. That's actually a pretty slow processor. Uh, the computer that um, I use for most of my work at home runs at about 3.6 gigahertz. So it's 3.6 billion cycles per second that it's able to process. By the way, the uh, computer that ran the space shuttle was probably in the maybe 100, 150 megahertz range. Not a very fast computer, but it only really had to do one thing, and that was navigation. So it did that very well and fast enough. So they didn't actually need a super fast computer. They just needed a reliable one. Okay, so we've talked about the connections inside your computer. These are the connections you're typically gonna use for uh, anything within a program. Um, in MATLAB, a lot of this is done automatically, so you don't really need to think too much about how you're accessing information, but if you find yourself calling on files that are saved on your hard drive, often, each time you call a file on your hard drive, that's gonna be slow. So you wanna do that as few times as possible. The best thing to do is read everything out of the file all at once. When you read a file from a hard drive, it reads directly, to the random access memory. So you read it all once, read the entire file in there, and then deal with all the information as you have it stored in your random access memory, rather than reading one piece at a time from the file, because each file access is slow. And the reason for that is each time you access a file in your hard drive, your computer sends a request to the hard drive, and it says, hey hard drive, send me this information then the hard drive sends the information back to the computer. Then the computer says, hey, hard drive, I got the information, thank you. So you've had to make this call, to make three calls here in order to take care of all this, and it takes a little while. Okay, so there are other connections to your computer that you can use. So we've talked about the serial ATA connection. Uh, that's typically an in interior connection in your computer. So everything's going to be inside the computer. You're not going to see this. You're not going to unplug it ever. Uh, there is what's called an E serial ATA or E SATA, which means external serial ATA. And you can use this to plug in an external hard drive if the hard drive is equipped to do that. And then you get the same kind of speeds with your external hard drive that you would get with your internal hard drives. Most external devices that you're gonna be using um, for transferring information into or out of your computer are gonna be plugged in via the USB connection. USB is a lot slower than serial ATA. It's a very good and fast connection. It's very good for transferring information. Uh, the, uh, the thumb drive has basically eliminated the floppy disk, the CD-ROM, the zip drive, and all kinds of other information transferring uh, protocols have been eliminated by the USB thumb drive. 
So um, while it's slower than the serial ATA, it's extremely convenient. Thumb drives are very durable. You could probably put one through your washing machine and as long as you dry it properly, it'll still work. Um, there used to be a, a data transfer device called the zip drive, which the disc, if you dropped it from about six inches high onto your desk, the disc could break and never work again and all the data on it would be lost. And it only held 50 megabytes versus your thumb drive, which a lot of them now are holding 16 gigabytes. So we can see why we've moved ahead here. But the USB connection is pretty slow in comparison to these others we've talked about. So I guess I should kind of go around and just rank these. So fastest is your level one, level two cache. Second fastest is your RAM. Third fastest is your hard drive, but it's much slower than the level one, level two cache and the RAM. So that's number three. Number four is gonna be your USB drive. That's the fourth fastest thing. After that, I'm not really gonna talk about any of the old fashioned technologies for transferring information, except for one that I'll mention a little bit later. Um, but I will mention stuff that we still use now. So the next connection that is gonna be fairly fast, but nowhere near as fast as any of the rest of these is your uh, network connection, your wired network connection. Now, wired network's not something you're using too often on your laptop, probably, but on a desktop computer, it's pretty handy, and it's a very reliable connection, and it's very fast. Um, typically, uh, modern wired network connections are uh, gigabit connections, so that's one gigabit that's different than a gigabyte. So a gigabit, a gigabyte, one byte is eight bits. So a gigabit is you know, one eighth of a, of a gigabyte, basically. Um, a one gigabit connection for a network drive is very fast. Um, typically that's gonna be what you'll find on your local network. Um, when you plug it into the internet, you're never gonna get even if they advertise that you're getting gigabit internet, which I don't think anybody even tries to advertise, you're never gonna reach that speed. So this is the speed on your wired network that's gonna be for your computer talking to your router and your router talking to another computer, both on the wired network. This has nothing to do with uh, leaving your house on the internet. That's gonna be much slower. Um, I think 300 megabits is probably about the best that you can get as a consumer. And even if you, you know, shell out the big bucks for the fast internet, it's never gonna be as fast as they advertise. So um, just keep that in mind. But one gigabit's kind of the maximum speed that you're gonna be connecting your uh, wired network with. Uh, there is a faster wired network protocol, it's called InfiniBand. Um, that's used in supercomputers to connect uh, the different pieces of a supercomputer together. Uh, the way a supercomputer actually works, it's not that it's, faster than a desktop computer. Typically it's slower individually, but it's made up of several thousand desktop computers all networked together and they share information. They need to do so at a very high speed. They use the InfiniBand connection to do that. The InfiniBand connection is faster than USB and uh, probably on the order of a very fast, the six gigabit per second, a gigabyte per second serial ATA. Um, so it's a much faster connection. It's also much, much more expensive. So you'll never see that in a home desktop computer. Uh, just to kind of, for a comparison, a network card for a home desktop computer, a gigabit network card, you can probably get one of those for about 20 bucks, probably less if you do a little shopping. Um, a wired router at home with wireless, so you can use it for Wi-Fi as well. You can get one of those for 20 to 40 bucks probably. Um, and that's pretty, you know, pretty affordable. If you were to do this all with InfiniBand, an InfiniBand uh, network card for your computer itself would probably cost on the order of about 600 to $1,000. An InfiniBand uh, switch, which is kind of like a router, but they don't call it that. An InfiniBand switch, you're talking five grand for a small one. And a small one's not actually small enough for home. Your home router usually has four wired connections. 
a smaller InfiniBand connection would probably have, have at least 24 wired connections. And they don't make them smaller than that because there's no need. So we'll stick with our gigabit internet. We can afford that. Even if we can't afford that, we definitely can't afford InfiniBand. So that's too, too expensive. Okay, so that's much slower than USB. I'm gonna draw a couple of dividing lines here. So on this side of the line, this is extremely fast. In this area here, we're pretty fast. I might even go so far as to say we're very fast. Let's do that, we'll call that very fast. Over here, with our one, one gigabyte or one gigabit wired connection, I'm gonna call this kind of fast. Okay, the next one is gonna be our wireless connection. Not all desktops have it. Um, none of my desktops have a working wireless connection. The next thing is your Wi-Fi. So your Wi-Fi connection is always gonna be slower than a wired network. You can get pretty fast Wi-Fi, but it's still never gonna be as fast as your wired network. So I'm just gonna call this fast. I don't know, does fast sound slower than kind of fast? Probably not, I'm gonna call that one fast and we'll call this one kind of fast. Your Wi-Fi connection's kind of fast, not very. Okay, next we're gonna get into some pretty slow, fairly old fashioned connections. So pretty slow is what's coming next here. Okay. Okay, so our pretty slow connection here our next connection, this is gonna be your monitor. I'll make that a widescreen monitor. It turns out the connection to the monitor is a pretty slow connection. So when you write a program, each time you want to display something on the screen, even if it's just one line of information that you wanna show on the screen, that's gonna slow down your program a lot. And it's similar to what happens with the, um, with the hard drive. Each time you wanna send something to the monitor, you send a piece of information to the monitor, the monitor actually calls back the computer and says, okay, got it, displayed it. So each time you do this, you have two-way communication and that slows things down a lot. So displaying on the screen is actually a way to slow down your program a lot. So another way to speed up a program if you're trying to improve performance is show less stuff on the screen. And most of the time when you write a program, in the end, there's not that much you really need to show on the screen. Mostly, you want to show the final answer. So ways to speed up a program, minimize screen displays, because that's pretty slow. All right, now we're going to get into another connection here. This is a connection that's real slow. This is your printer. I'm gonna draw a picture of a printer here. Hopefully it looks kind of like a printer. It's a sad printer. The connection from a computer to a printer is one of the oldest connections that uh, has been designed. Uh, the protocols for connecting to a printer from a computer were written in the 1970s, and very little has changed since then. There's really not been a lot of effort to speed up the connection to a printer, because you don't really need to. Because a printer, the actual spraying ink on a piece of paper and spitting out the piece of paper is a very slow process. Compared to anything else the computer does, it's very slow. So there's no need to really keep up, there's nothing to keep up with, so there's no need to make the protocol any faster. So. Uh, Sending information to your printer is extremely slow compared to anything else we've talked about so far. That's gonna be the slowest connection. 
So if you're using that kind of a connection to transfer information for anything, don't expect it to be fast. That's going to be very slow. There's nothing we're really going to do in this, in this class where we get to choose that kind of a connection. But you actually can print directly from MATLAB. I'm not even going to teach you how to do it because there's no need and it's very slow. Okay. So one last connection I want to show you. And this is the slowest thing of all for your entire computer setup. I'm just going to draw a picture. I will show you what the slowest piece of your computer programming is. You are the slowest part of the computer. You are the slowest. So anytime you are a part of your computer program, you are slowing things down. If your program requires you to enter a number, it's gonna wait for you to enter the number. It'll wait longer than it'll take to run the entire program. It's gonna wait longer for you to enter that number than anything else it's gonna do. So if you want to improve the speed of a program, eliminate yourself from it. Get the program to do everything in an automated way without the user needing to interact with the program at all.